So good morning everybody. I'm here to introduce to you Akanksha Janeja. She's an experienced data scientist with a demonstrated history of working in the information technology and research industry. She is skilled in artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing, computer vision, Python programming. She's got to her credit uh, a B.Tech and M.Tech and a Ph.D. in computer science with relevant certifications and a good number of publications. Um, she, her expertise lies in artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, NLP, chatbot, uh, virtual assistants, predictive modeling. Uh, she currently works with Accenture and has worked also as an assistant professor at the National Institute of Technology in Delhi where she is primarily assisted in teaching artificial intelligence and machine learning courses for, the, for uh, graduate and postgraduate students. She is here today to take us through a session which will um, uh, basically be on understanding natural language and using machine learning. A uh, very well planned out workshop for us, so I'd like to welcome Akanksha Janeja to us, uh, to Aegis. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. How are you? So, uh, is the topic familiar? How many of you are familiar with natural language processing? Okay, uh, good number. Uh, so, let's keep it this way that um, I'll start with the basics. Whenever it is the case that it's getting too basic, you can let me know. Let's keep it interactive. And uh, when it's getting too complex, you can let me know. Uh, works this way? Great. So, um, we'll be discussing how do we understand natural languages using machine learning. So, quickly I'll move to what we'll be covering. We'll be covering uh, basic aspects of natural language processing, what natural language processing is what are the various applications of machine learning in understanding the natural language, technical and algorithmic, algorithmic details in uh, natural language processing, how we actually break down the text and analyze it and uh, we'll be following it up with some hands-on. So these are some of the snippets I've taken from latest articles on the net uh, by various uh, authors about NLP. So it's kind of a buzzword also these days, but it's not just a buzzword, it's actually working. So we can just have a look that even in healthcare, NLP is making people make clinical decisions using AI and the uh, growth rate of NLP is expected to be very high in some years. And uh, basically, like you can see here, uh, language processing global market and the key players dialogue flow and Apple basically this article talks about the chatbots. We'll be touching upon that topic too. So what is natural language processing? It is, uh, so those of you who have already uh, learnt about NLP uh, would already be knowing. For those of you who are new, it's uh, at the intersection of computer science, artificial intelligence and linguistics. Computer science we know. AI we know, linguistics is basically the science or the art of languages that we speak. Any language, English, Hindi, whatever are the spoken languages, they all have their specific detailing and intricacies which all come under the linguistics of that language. So when we are trying to understand natural languages, definitely knowing the linguistics, the grammar and how the word formation of that languages that is also important and we want computers to learn that when we are doing NLP using machine learning. So basically the goal is like we understand natural languages, we want computers also to understand natural languages so that they can perform the task which we want them to perform for us. So. Uh, are you all aware what is meant by structured data? 
so when we are talking of machine learning problems we require data to be in the form of some samples and some features through which we can learn some patterns or characteristics these features are typically numerical features and or categorical whatever they can be and from that the classifier learns classifier or even if i am talking of some unsupervised learning classifier comes under supervised in any form of learning it needs some set of features and the same set of features for the n number of samples that i have so that it can learn something out of it and be able to differentiate and find similarities and differences in the samples that i have that is called structured data but the textual data that we have that is unstructured when i say unstructured why because we don't have the same number of words in different sentences that we speak we don't have same number of characters in different words that we speak or write so in a way we cannot exactly categorize or the, 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 the raw data given to us as text is not in the form of rows and columns we have some samples of sentences and we don't have exactly the same number of dimensions of that all the sentences have different number of words and each word and basically the length of each sentence the user utterance we call it utterance in terms of uh, when we are using ma uh, machine learning so definitely we want to understand the something which uh, has been said or written by the user so at uh, user utterance that all the utterances have variable length so it's an unstructured form of data so only 21% of the available data is in structured form this is as per the industry estimate some studies have uh, analyzed it and more and more data that is being generated as we speak as we like on twitter when we tweet on facebook when we write when on some of the e-commerce website we post some reviews all of these things are essential for those companies so they collect the database and do some research at the back end so this is all unstructured data so when we say that we are talking of unstructured data majority of the data that we deal with this time at when we talk of machine learning applications that is unstructured so first of all making sense out of the unstructured data that is a primary step when we talk of natural language processing so these are some of the examples that are covered which are, which are actually in real time constantly generating data which is becoming more and more available for our studies based on machine learning and developing the various applications uh, tweets chat logs news blogs and articles product reviews and patient records in healthcare okay so uh, so yeah now uh, moving to the next part that we have so much data available and we have to analyze something out of it and we have to make sense out of it and we have to automate some, some task we have to derive some information out of it in a smart and efficient manner right so in order to automate some task we want that whatever enormous amount of data is present for us we should be able to understand that that is why natural language processing is important okay so like i've already told you there's a lot of data we need to automate some task and solve a wide variety of problems these are some of the latest problems which are being aimed at for solving in various uh, companies and even in research in academia for various business problems and we'll be discussing how each of the each of these cater to various business problems sentiment analysis speech recognition document summarization machine translation and question answering i'll be discussing all of these in details so basically the uh, all these i just mentioned previously are somehow related to these which are the most trending applications and problems in natural language processing which are ongoing and have a very fast growing state of the art and people are largely contributing to no innovative ideas and it has a huge scope of innovation text classification speech recognition caption generation document summarization and question answering there are many more i'll be covering these two these uh, all these here so what is text classification a typical example of text classification is sentiment analysis uh, you would have heard of that people do sentiment analysis on twitter 
uh, on tweets, uh, basically sentiment analysis on the product reviews, even uh, news articles, etc. People keep on, especially at the time of you know voting and also people do follow the post and do so all sorts of sentiment analysis to see what are the views of people. For companies it becomes all the more important because they want to know if they have launched a new product, what is the view, what is the view in the market of consumers about their particular product. So just by uh, looking at the tweets, they won't be able to analyze what's the trend, is their product being liked or disliked so that they can you know make further improvements to their products so sentiment analysis so basically sentiment analysis is you have a piece of text in which the user has written something and it conveys what is the sentiment of the user or the consumer of a particular product or anything to convey what they want to convey their liking or disliking positive or negative for that particular service or a product there are more examples of text classification spam filtering very common one. Uh, how do you make out of the email that you've got whether it's a spam or not? It's You can't just uh, simply set some rules because spammers usually find new ways. So there has to be some pattern which we cannot and, and a lot of patterns which we cannot just simply uh, put up in the form of rules. So we need some form of natural language processing out of the mails and then followed by machine learning so as to analyze uh, whether and classify whether an incoming mail is a spam or a non-spam language identification given the text how, how do you know initially what language it is so basically based on the words that it use and finds the pattern and finding the language genre classification you have novels and you have summaries of movies etc and even in music finding out to what category this particular piece of text or a speech belongs that is also important because a lot of incoming uh, a lot of uh, novels, articles, music and all the databases always increasing. So again, everything comes down to that there is availability of huge availability of data and humans cannot just do it manually. So it all comes down to automation. So wherever there is something that you have a set of labels and a piece of text you have to assign to some or the other label that all comes under the head of text classification. I hope it is clear till now. So positive and negative was, was just example. Similarly, you can also move to multi-label classification where you just not have positive or negative. It can be very positive, positive, neutral, negative and very negative. These become the five classes and like, like this you can actually define to what depth of categorization you want to go. Uh, and another example of this is suppose you have uh, tweets and then you just want to predict what should be the relevant hash trending hashtags for these tweets? So suppose you want to predict what would be the uh, out of the trending hashtags, which one would this be suitable? Let's say you have top 10 per day and you want to predict this one is if it is trending then which one it is. So that is also a multi-class problem. Uh, speech recognition again uh, when especially in uh, voice based assistance where it has to recognize who is speaking and based on that they uh, give an answer when it's your specialized uh, personalized virtual assistant then in that particular case the task of typically the uh, this is the definition you can read that basically the task is to understand from the signal of voice that whether to which person this speech belongs to right so you have a sequence of words by the speaker and based on the acoustic signal of the spoken language you have to identify who the speaker is this is uh, this all comes under speech recognition as well and speech to text conversion as well when someone is speaking and you have to automatically convert it into text so text to speech so basically the examples are uh, there's a video and there's a movie or TV show and you have to uh, automatically generate the uh, subtitles and transcribing a speech whether it's something some instructions and you just 
you were speaking over the radio or speaking over some application and it writes down whatever you are speaking. Caption generation is, a, is an interesting problem wherein you have uh, images or uh, documents and from that you have to simply write a crisp caption as to what it is about. For example, this is an image and what it is describing. So just like one or two lines and this is helpful when you know uh, in case of videos caption generation for uh, hearing impaired and in case of images for visual impaired just to let them know what is being shown rather than simply expl someone converting uh, you know uh, translating it to them that whatever is going on. Document sum summarization sometimes we have a huge uh, size of documents and we want to summarize those we could just get the abridged version so that it makes sense and you just get the whole gist of it so that also is a task in uh, NLP. Uh, question answering basically this is a very uh, interesting problem and it is typically uh, getting very much uh, usage in chatbots because uh, people have started using chatbots for asking any of the queries and usually queries are not like uh, when we have when we want to ask something so it will be grammatically correct or not. So the major challenge is that the user has asked something and from that query you have the bot has to understand or if any software has to basically understand what is being said and has to actually go back to the database fetch the relevant answer and give back as the answer. So basically any question is being asked and the computer has to somehow solve it either it has some textual uh, documents over which it searches whatever will be the relevant and retrieves it or it may be attached uh, connected to a database in which you know things are present in, in form of a graph or a uh, rows and column relational database and from that fetching what is the value that is required by the user. So those are different types of question answering systems which are trending these days. So IBM Watson is one such question answering system you can read about more about it it is very popular and now it is finding more and more application in different areas even like healthcare etc. Chatbots are an interesting application and a chatbot involves different layers uh, of uh, processing uh, starting from the scratch of the user utterance and uh, extending to what action should be taken, series of actions should be taken and that has various different uh, applications of uh, NLP and machine learning and why chatbots are becoming uh, popular these days because people are tending to become more and more comfortable while chatting rather than speaking out. You would always prefer uh, chatting over if you have a chatbot rather than waiting for a customer care executive on hold to listen to your call. Especially if it is some problem which you have been dealing for some days you have already mailed about it and repeatedly uh, next time you call it is another customer care executive you have to explain the whole problem all, the, all over again. So chatbots come in handy and people are more and more comfortable uh, exchanging chats and they are ex extremely in demand these days. And uh, the common ones, the famous one we all know uh, are now becoming part of our homes and lives. So basically the definition of a chatbot is it is a computer program that is designed to assist humans uh, especially over the internet. It can be embedded in a website, it can be embedded in an application and humans can interact over it and it responds appropriately. We just went too far. Okay. So these are some of the uh, analy analysis behind chatbots and what is the projected usage of chatbots and showing uh, why are they important. Uh, basically why businesses need chatbots to get rid of your routine tasks. Sometimes it happens that multiple users are asking the same queries. So if a chatbot is designed to uh, cater to that sort of a query you do not re need redundancy that multi same executive is handling the same user request for others and there is tremendous speed because there is no waiting on calls. It is not about uh, taking away a job of some customer care representative it is just 
making them equipped with a system that uh, it, it's very fast and so that humans, human agent can be a fallback option that the regular stuff can be taken care of by the chatbot and only when it comes to very complex that the chatbot can, can't handle then the humans can. So this makes the whole processing very fast and saves time both of the consumers as well as of the companies. So I'll quickly move you through the various import, uh, necessities of chatbots and their uh, importance in various uh, businesses. So helps in improving the customer service. Uh, if you are talking, if you talk of some online shopping or something, then it streamlines your process. Whatever queries you have, relevant department, it can fetch. Uh, no need to repeat several times what you want. And chatbot also, uh, when you have an account and chatbot remembers your uh, history and usage pattern and gives you personalized answers. So that's also something. Um, definitely it's parallel processing. So every consumer feels that they have, they are the foremost important person because they're not kept holding. And uh, that's how companies or businesses gain popularity among people. Improved response rate because chatbots are always available. Uh, sometimes the questions get repeated like I already said. So uh, basic chatbots, there are two types of chatbots. One are the simple chatbots like the ones which uh, were when we were like like 10 decade back which just chit chatted they you you, you had they had some pre fed answers based on what you said they gave those answers there was nothing smart in them they could not fetch some information from the internet they could not be witty those are some elements which are coming up with chatbots these days they could not have multi turn conversation as in so you ask something and the the already stated response to it saved in the uh, backend and it gives to you. Those are like the simple chatbots. There are already prepared command. Smart chatbots are the ones which leverage on the uh, technologies like the NLP and machine learning and the mathematics behind that and they try to actually understand what you're trying to say and even if it's something new that they have not seen before, they will try to break down and recognize the pattern and then act accordingly. Basically, smart chatbots can also be uh, broken down into two part, two types of chatbots, uh, task oriented and question answering. Like I told question answering systems, so question answering bots deploy that technology. Task oriented are when you do a conversation over a series of steps and you get some task done by a chatbot. Assume there is a chatbot to book a cab for you. So it, you, you say book a cab for me, it will ask you. Uh, what time from where so that will be a conversation and while it fetches information from you once it's done fetching information from you it will perform that particular task for you. So simple chatbots like I told you already pre-written commands and depending upon what the user says they give some appropriate answer. Smart chatbots rely on artificial intelligence uh, instead of prepared answers uh, it uh, gives you suggestions on the topic if it's something new if it's uh, something relevant to the chat history, then it already it's already trained. So you train a machine learning model at the back end and that the chatbot basically drives on top of that. So but again, it's not magic. We, we all need to contribute to this uh, this research and development as professionals, whatever you know, in whatever way innovation we can do to contribute to this particular field because it's still evolving and there's a lot to be done. So uh, if any of you are interested to uh, you know experiment with chatbots, so these are two common uh, chatbot frameworks which are available. Uh, more are available like Google Dialogflow and Microsoft and uh, some more are available you can look up. Uh, what they offer, they already have established algorithms and you can upload your data and choose from the data available and you can train your data and then you can make calls to predict uh, your data. What happens over here is uh, the, 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 uh, there's a pre-built system which you just need to train and what happens over here is you, uh, what one intricacy here is that when you upload some data, it goes to the servers definitely. So you, you 
uh, have to take care that if you're using some data which is confidential and you're not supposed to share then you can you have to take care of that for that also there are uh, open source frameworks available when you have to build some applications which have to be in-house and on-premise wherein you don't want to put up the data on a server and you want it to be uh, really uh, at the stage where it is being deployed and also an advantage over there is I mean both have their own whichever is suitable to you one thing over here is that uh, if you use uh, an open source framework where you can actually build your own bot from scratch your own algorithms you can uh, perform all sorts of pre-processing that you want to do you can actually get into that and build it from scratch so that is the advantage of open source network the advantage of existing uh, frameworks is that they offer high computational power systems already in place you can use the, use the clouds over there and you get enough memory and uh, computing power so depending upon your application you can uh, go for any of the frameworks if you are interested one such framework I'll share uh, which is uh, becoming popular in uh, for building uh, chatbots is an open source framework rasa and it has two main components uh, for one for natural language understanding the other for core uh, when we talk of nlp that part comes in the rasa nlu and uh, how it does uh, i think yeah so how it does is basically it extracts what is the user intent so the, that, the, these steps are same whether you talk of dialog flow or another any existing framework or an open source framework that you will you have to do an intent recognition intent recognition is also one kind of text classification it's actually a text classification like we discussed text classification wherein we do sentiment analysis likewise intent recognition means that you are training a bot to cater to or to respond to some set of problems those are intents and in future let's say your bot can handle five types of texts and in future a new one comes it should know out of these five categories where this part what this one lies so that will help the chatbot know before taking any action that what the user intends what is the user query all about and that's how the chatbot takes a decision what action it has to perform so the, the thing that enables chatbots to understand what the user wants to get done is called intent recognition which is a text class which is an example of text classification so basically what you have to design is an intent classifier based on your training data so that you understand what the user wants to get done or even if it's a question then what type of question depending upon if you already have some classes of questions and entities entities are basically when you when the user has uttered something what are the parts in that breaking that sentence to understand if it's about some people then what is the name of the person is it a place is it a thing is it a location anything it could be so entities are basically some broken down elements of the sentence which actually make up the sentence and mean something and which helps the chatbot decide what to do so basically intent and entities these are two examples i'm just giving an example of how it happens in an open source framework let's say um, this is a famous uh, data set you can just check if you want to start uh, uh, for chatbots uh, like the facebook bai stories about you know it's about a restaurant booking example so i'm looking for a mexican restaurant in the center of town so the intent is that the, the user wants to search for a restaurant and there's a machine learning algorithm you've trained you, you'll be training to know the intent there is also a machine learning algorithm that's a class of sequence labeling algorithm that helps you label what are the different intents in the sentence so from this sentence uh, based on the training data because the training data also has such examples wherein the user would have asked for some cuisine in some part of the city so it knows that mexican is a cuisine it predicts that mexican is a cuisine and uh, location is center so this is one example of how you provide annotated data because we have to do machine learning so you we have to provide some kind of ground truth to, to the machine learning classifier so this is just a typical uh, example how it works you have to provide what the intent is 
that will be your class name and you have to also provide what are the entities into it. Various problems of uh, NLP and machine learning have various ways of annotating as in when you start uh, practicing and working on it you would get to know how what kind of annotations or what is the template in which you have to provide data to training data to your algorithms. So basically this is something which is apart from NLU uh, when you have you have done the natural language understanding from the uh, from uh, using Rasa NLU or any other N natural language you can build your own. Uh, what happens is the, based on that once it is found what is the intent, when, once it is found what are the different entities, what based on that again this is the dialogue manager basically which deals with okay this is the state now what action has to be done. So this is not uh, like what is exactly natural language understanding but this is also uh, this also has machine learning involved in it. When it's not working, you can press it for me. Okay, okay so uh, this is basically the framework and usually open source frameworks uh, are somehow like that. All of them have a common characteristic that uh, you, you know you'll send some uh, information, there would be a stack which would be having the natural language understanding unit again within that from pre-processing to all the different classification steps followed by a dialogue manager which would be taking deciding what action is to be taken and it would all it could also be depending upon your application it could also be attached to a backend database if the bot is required to uh, you know fetch some uh, information from the uh, backend and fetch. So this is the overall uh, flow of uh, w when we are uh, working with text and we want to perform some sort of uh, machine learning uh, algorithm on it. You have the natural language input uh, on top the flow over there this part is the classical learning which we call the traditional machine learning algorithms wherein you have some input this is like common to uh, you know all the machine learning applications you have some input you perform some sort of processing, you extract some features to make your data st in the structured format and you pass it on for classification. Classification could be anything and not just classification, it could be an unsupervised learning, it could be a supervised learning and uh, what happens over here is for example like I told you entity recognition that if it is a sentence then what are the different parts of it, entities in that, text classification, it could be a problem of machine translation where you have a text in one uh, language and you want to convert it into another language that could be a task of machine translation, it could be a task of document summarization, not this classification. Overall this is the flow when you have any kind of ML algorithm to you want to employ that you have text processing and you have you do some feature extraction on top of it and then you have any of your learning algorithms uh, working on those features. Now if your data is labeled it would be a supervised problem, if your data is unlabeled it would be an unsupervised problem. Uh, so basically labeled and unlabeled unla uh, in case uh, I, I need to clarify it just means that you know the ground truth what is a particular category in case of the input. Uh, this is uh, another kind of learning which is deep learning we all would have, uh, have heard of it. It is different from classical learning because here we train an end to end model, we do not put any handcrafted features Th that means the programmer does not decide explicitly what features they want uh, and I will be discussing uh, some common feature extraction techniques in NLP. Uh, so then you will uh, understand like maybe uh, some of you already know what handcrafting means, handcrafting means that you explain give some formula etc based on which you extract some information right and uh, whereas uh, what happens in case of deep learning you provide a neural network several layers of neural network that depends on the complexity you want and definitely there is there is a limitation to it that depends on the number of data points that you have the your your uh, system which is very complex but you have lesser number of data points that also is not uh, a good a good idea. So again that is upon you know that is something you have to tune and understand on the basis of your data. 
so here what happens you don't ex explicitly provide the features you provide a network which you think is suitable for the data size that you have and the problem that you have there are a lot of deep learning networks uh, for various types of problems and they learn mathematical uh, values from your data and then feed to a classifier which is also one particular layer it cl again classifier or unsupervised whatever you want it can be a last layer and then it this can be the output layer which gives the decision on uh, the input that you have so basically this is the overall flow of how uh, natural language processing works with machine learning uh, catering to multiple problems that we can have okay so starting from the basics of nlp uh, you can let me know if uh, this has um, already been covered so like i mentioned uh, you have to make the intelligent systems or your computers your ai based softwares to understand what what uh, natural language is to understand so that they have they have to communicate with people uh, it is required when you want a software to perform as per your instructions and you speak in a natural language uh, it, it's a field of uh, uh, study where you know you want computers to behave in a way like humans do and for that it is important for computers to understand the language of humans basically there are two types of input and output of NLP systems like in the previous uh, uh, slide we just saw uh, that it could be a machine translation so it could be a sp speech to text it could be a sp uh, text to speech text to text uh, input can be text uh, output can be speech so I mean the, the, this is the uh, option that your input can be either speech or text and your output can be either speech or text or a decision on the text or speech that you input so various difficulties in NLP are the ambiguities because natural language is ambiguous uh, it's not a formal language that you have written something so it is just one meaning out of it uh, various sentences that we speak uh, they can have multiple meanings so lexical ambiguity is uh, at the lexicon level lexical uh, means at the word level so we have ambiguities at word level there are many words uh, for example in English wherein you don't know what it exactly means for example this word play it can mean that it's a verb that someone is playing it could be a play which is an act or a you know someone is uh, acting in a theater or, a, uh, or something a syntax level ambiguity just like we have syntax in our uh, normal programming languages when we talk of natural languages syntax means this this how the structure of the sentence is so uh, simple she held the rat with pink cap so what do you is the rat wearing the pink cap or is she holding the rat with a pink cap so there is an ambiguity which is syntactical ambiguity here you can make up uh, different meanings out of it there is another uh, ambiguity which is referential ambiguity again this is an example of it that uh, sometimes uh, followed by nouns we use pronouns so we don't know whether we are referring to whom uh, if it had been a, a, a male and a female then she would have made sense uh, but uh, but they ha I mean she is sad something like that but here it is two people and something like that she said I am sad so who is she both are girls so uh, it's ambiguous what do you refer out of it so uh, input can one input can mean different meanings and it's also possible that multiple inputs mean the same so multiple things mean the same and same thing can make multiple meanings so that's a difficulty in NLP uh, basic terminology which if you are working in the area of NLP then you need to know uh, so that you know it's better so that we can take care of this uh, this stuff when uh, writing algorithms uh, phonology is the study of sound morphology is the construction of word from their primitive meaning for example play is the root of a word and playing player all these are formed out of it so they have a common morphology uh, syntax is how you arrange different words in a sentence and semantics is one level above syntax is what is the meaning of that sentence what how you combine the words so what is the meaning of that phrase or a sentence you get out of it um, okay okay uh, these are uh, 
I mean going a higher in level pragmatics is uh, using and understanding sentences in different situation and how uh, the interpreting basically uh, semantics is meaning and then you un interpret that meaning discourse is uh, how immediately preceding sentence can affect the interpretation of the next sentence that means you have interpreted a sentence but it while we are talking uh, it also happens that when I speak a sentence uh, you might not understand it the way in isolation but what I just said before it would make a lot of sense uh, to interpret it and also what I say next. So it's kind of the surrounding sentences make uh, are helpful in understanding the interpretation of a particular sentence and knowledge is basically what you if you are reading a document so what you grasp out of it. So it's like going uh, up in the level. So uh, likewise we, we got to know the various levels uh, even uh, that's kind of the hierarchy that we follow when we are applying steps in understanding the natural languages. One is the lexical analysis uh, makes sense we have to understand at the word level syntactic analysis wherein we have to understand at the uh, how the structure of the sentence is. Um, uh, you have to do the semantic analysis wherein you understand try to understand the meaning of the uh, sentence again uh, discourse integration like we have in discourse so your algorithm should also if you build an analysis algorithm that keeps uh, these things in mind again pragmatic so I hope now this makes sense that whatever are the terminologies there that the same hierarchy is here and we have to uh, depending upon applications what all we have to uh, understand and what all we have to analyze. So that that is how uh, uh, you go first you go at the word level then you go at the sentence level then you understand the meaning of the sentence then you see how the before and after sentences kind of influence the meaning and then you go at the uh, complete uh, understanding. So uh, again uh, like we have seen what all are the various uh, ca like levels of going deeper into uh, uh, various sentences and their understanding their meaning. Now coming back to how we actually start with uh, pre-processing of the sentences. Now just imagine that you have an user input so what is the terminology and how we go about it. So when you have a sentence, a word or an article whatever you call it as an input, you call it as a text object. It can be a word to you, two words, a sentence, number of sentences, a document. Okay? Uh, token, uh, so when you have a text object each word in that is called token. So that is common we, we uh, when using uh, working on NLP it is very common to say tokens instead of just words. Tokenization is the process of converting a text object into its constituent tokens. Okay? So these three make sense. Okay, so text. Uh, is like we discussed the most unstructured form of data available to us and when we receive some text it is not readily available for a machine learning algorithm to act upon. So we need some kind of text processing right this is before like we have pre-processing in most of our machine learning problems where uh, we do all sorts of visualization to you know drop the uh, Noi noisy variables, drop the missing values, all those which are the standard steps. Likewise here in text also right before feeding the text to a feature extraction or a deep learning method to actually you know uh, get some numerical features out of it. There are some things which we have to take care which we as humans know would lead to a poor performance of the system. So cleaning of the data basically. So text processing is basically cleaning of the text and making it noise free and ready for analysis. Basically a lot of things are covered under text processing, major ones are removal of noise, lexical uh, normalization and object standardization. Uh, there are other types like encoding, decoding and grammar checker, spelling correction etc. Uh, so let's just discuss these three. Uh, what is noise removal? It's like there are some words depending upon your application you know that these would not be relevant for your algorithm 
and feeding them to the algorithm would only add on to more and more size of the data and nothing uh, meaningful will come out of it. So such things are known as noise removal. Uh, an example of noise, when we do noise removal is top word removal. So these uh, is am, the, of, uh, in, etc. These are uh, stop words basically and it's not that these are noise for all NLP applications. It may be that in some NLP application these make sense but uh, suppose you are doing sentiment analysis, you want to just classify into positive and negative. So the words that the user has used instead of the stop words make sense and the stop words would be common across the two classes. So you can remove the stop words. Uh, when you are talking of tweets, uh, if you are if you're discussing something about the trending, uh, then okay, you want to see what is the hashtag, otherwise you want to remove the hashtag, right. So cleaning up basically is called the uh, uh, text uh, noise removal and uh, basically you can prepare a lookup table or a dictionary of what all is noisy as uh, with respect to the particular problem that you are working and in this text processing step you can remove those noise. Uh, lexical normalization is that there are multiple representations of a, a, a word and we want to tag make them all same so that it, it, it's no more confusing to the machine learning classifier. So like for example play, player, played, plays, playing, there are different variations of the word play. So if we do some kind of normalization and during text processing all these words are replaced by one particular word. So we have normalized all of them to play. So when the algorithm is doing something, so it knows that play is the main thing that it has to focus on that something is going around and playing and various you know it's like instead of having five or six things that mean the same thing you have kind of made it one as a representation of all and uh, this representation is also called lemma so basically play uh, is kind of the root of play player played plays playing so that's how you lemma uh, get the lemma out of words okay so basically most common practices are stemming and lemmatization. Stemming is more uh, basic level where it simply chops off the uh, extra part of a word like ES, S, ING, etc. And lemmatization is more around it, it maintains a dictionary and knows that what is the root and uh, gives back what is the root of that. So for example, if it's about, uh, if we are uh, talking about swimming, or something so swim is the root so something like that you get to know actually what activity is going on rather than uh, maintaining or giving all possible variations to the uh, feature extraction or the machine learning module okay uh, the other is uh, the third one that we discuss uh, i mentioned is object standardization so what is happening over here is that there are some uh, things which are not present in the common English language. So how would a system or, a, or an algorithm that you train uh, using you know linguistic techniques or a machine learning with some rules on linguistics, how would it know? So these are not uh, recognized by search engines and models. Uh, for example, uh, abbreviations. So if you are talking of some uh, abbreviation or for example writing a product review and instead of writing G O D good, you write G U D. Instead of writing G R E A T, you write G R 8, numeric 8, G R T. So these are some things which are not there in your uh, English corpus. In the regular English language does not have it. So, the, so depending upon your problem at hand, you better know. You know by visualizing the data that what could be such terms which are not in the standard uh, dictionaries and uh, corp uh, corpora that you refer to while uh, you know building a machine learning uh, algorithm but uh, you can always provide a lookup table and replace these with the standard uh, notations that they actually mean and this all comes under pre-processing and you can then feed it to the uh, classifier or your feature extraction whatever algorithm that you have. So. Uh, once we have performed all sorts of text processing, we have to do some feature engineering on top of it and uh, I will be discussing some of the, the classical feature engineering methods over here. We will move to the 
common deep learning methods also later right now discussing uh, the common feature engineering method so basically to analyze the analyze a pre processed data we have to convert it into features numeric like we know uh, and we have to uh, we have a lot of techniques for this uh, syntactic techniques which you know parse the syntax uh, getting the entities out of it entity uh, extraction n grams basically a token is also called a gram so n gram is a sequence of tokens so we'll be discussing it next uh, i mean in the later slides a bigram is a, a sequence of two tokens that occur together trigram is three tokens so that also is kind of a feature extraction wherein you see what two or three or n tokens are occurring together so that also helps you analyze similarity in sentences there there can be phrases which occur across different sentences which can show that these two sentences are similar so something like this there can be statistical features and when we say statistical features those means that we are counting something out of the the words in the uh, sentences and word embeddings word embeddings is also uh, a very uh, kind of now an important topic in nlp understanding words and their vectorization and we will be discussing it so uh, giving you a glimpse of how syntactic uh, parsing works we we are discussing basis of syntax so syntax basically means kind of the grammar in that so this is a sentence so pos basically means part of speech so this is a common for, for a kind of feature extraction part of speech tagging we have a sentence and we want to tag what is the part of speech of the sentence means what is the noun what is the verb what is the adjective so on so that helps you fetch the features out of the sentences uh, when you talk of dependency trees it means that breaking down the uh, sentence into a form that what is the root what is the subject of this particular sentence so john is the particular sentence what is the object ball is the object what is what is being done mainly john is hitting the ball so this becomes the root so that's how you kind of try to analyze the sentence by breaking it down because ultimately we want to make it understandable for the computers uh statistical features uh so like i told you that we do some kind of counting or some number uh, numbers we we have to find out out of features so a very common model for uh, st statistical features is bag of words i have simply taken this uh, picture from somewhere to represent that exactly this is bag of word whatever data that you have you collect all the words that are present in the data and that is your bag of word right so that kind of kind of gives you your uh, lexical resource of the data set that you have what all words are there what your vocabulary basically of your training data so once you have the vocabulary it's it comes handy because um, in a sense if you just thinking of a text classification binary classification so the kind of words in the positive class the usage of words in the positive class the occurrence of words would be varied Uh, from the words that you use in the negative classes when you you like cursing something and while you are praising something so the usage of words would be different so that helps you understand the patterns and you know kind of differentiate between the the word patterns in one class word patterns in another class so you have the bag of words and that helps you find the features that which all words are present in this particular sentence for example just just kind of elaborating it let's say we have these sentences i like english movies action movies are my favorite people like comedy movies i like horror movies any mo any sentence around movies so what is the bag of word here this is the bag of word all the words co co combined and that gives me a, a set of all the words that i have in my uh, uh, i mean the whole uh, corpus that i have that is called bag of word Uh, so how how do we use this bag of word to represent sentences so for example representing sentences means we have to create vectors out of it so we all know that we have to provide feature create features features are nothing but vectors and machine learning algorithms want that all your sample should have the so we are moving towards making 
unstructured data into a structured data. We will be using this example of bag of word, we will see how we had sentences and now we are creating vectors of similar length from all the sentences which had variable length. So uh, let us take the first sentence, I like English movies. So I, so I, we have this bag of word, I like English movies. So the first one, I gets a 1, like gets a 1, English movies, these 4 will be 1 and all other will be 0. So we have 11 words in our bag of word. So this will cause a 11 length vector, first 4 as 1, the other as 0. Likewise, can you tell me what, okay. Can you tell me what would be for action movies are my favorite? Zero, 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 zero,
sorry I have a document uh, J and in that I have some terms. So, what is the value that I attach to a particular word I J, word I in a document J is TFI that means the number of times that particular the number of occurrences of I in J TFI J. So, this is the number of occurrences right. Now, what what, what uh, beyond count vectorizer what TFIDF does is it may be possible that some terms are occurring frequently, but occurring frequently across all the test uh, all the samples. So, such words are in, in fact they are not important. Something which occurs frequently in some samples can give me a cue that ok this means something, but if something is occurring every time it is it's a, it's a review on movies. So, the word movie would be almost there in all the sentences even if it is a positive review or a negative review. So, I do not want to lay emphasis on such words which are occurring across all the documents right. So, that is why it aims to convert text documents into vector models on the basis of occurrence of words and documents without considering the exact ordering that is one thing and also what is happening we are attaching a term over here inverse of document frequency log of n by dfi, dfi means the number of documents which contain this word and n is the total number of documents right. So, as you would see if dfi approaches n this value would be this value would be approaching 1 and this value would be approaching nearly 0 and then this whole complete value becomes lesser right. So, that means we are giving more weightage to those sentences which occur frequently, but not across the whole corpus, but and at the same time we want to reduce the weightage of documents which occur frequently, but are occurring across the whole text ok. So, basically this whole process like I mentioned of converting the words into vectors of some particular size is called vectorization, but the problem here is that this was just like 11 4 sentences and in that we got 11 words. How many sentences more we can have and how many words we have in English if we just keep on creating a vector equivalent to the vocabulary size it will be very huge. Second problem this is no way capturing the meaning right the word hotel and ho word accommodation or lodging they have nothing in common if we are creating vectors. We also need some kind of vectorization that keeps into mind the meaning of the words. That means vectorization is nothing but let us in this particular case I had the vocabulary size v I projected my sentences into a v dimensional space right but and in that space words which are nearby do not make any sense in similarity uh, everyone is following this. So, definitely there is a need for a vectorization which is a little bit lesser in size manageable size and is not into in like thousands or lakhs because that is usually the vocabulary size we get when we are handling large data sets and it should be such that it should have a meaning out of it I am projecting sentences to a, or words to a space. So, I should get some kind of a mathematics there like we have a Euclidean space that points ve two vectors which are similar would have a would have would be the vectors would be close right. So, you take the cosine similarity of that. So, something like this mathematics should be there that if I want to find that two words are having different characters, but their meanings are similar then they sh practically if I am projecting words to a different space in that space these words which which have same context they should be very close to each other. So, this uh, brings us to a very interesting topic that is word embedding right. So, ok. So, word embedding is it is a technique which maps past word vectors into continuous space based on surrounding context. Now, what does this mean? 
when we were talking of vectorization, the vectors that we created, they were sparse. They had many zeros and lesser number of ones. We actually don't want that. We want to map these sparse word vectors because the vocabulary is huge and typically an English sentence is not that huge, maximum 10 words, 15 or if you are talking of one document, 30, 40, whatever, it won't go to thousands or lakhs, but the vocabulary size would be huge. So, if you create the vectors that we, we just uh, discussed before, that is sparse, but we have to convert it into some kind of space which has a lesser, which is dense, lesser number of zeros and more numbers out of it and the word surrounding the word should be similar in context to that word. So basically it is a process of embedding, embedding is basically mapping, transforming a high dimensional vector that means the sparse vector in the actual vocabulary space to a lower dimensional space say 100, 300 that is the typical uh, size of the state of the art word embeddings. This vector representation provides convenient properties and ways of uh, comparing words or phrases. Uh, for example, uh, if I am talking of, of text classification then uh, it's just not the, the words diff could be different, uh, good, pleasing, uh, great, but syntactically they don't, you won't be able to find a similarity. But if you are able to map it to a space where good and great are similar, then your features would make much more sense to your classifier. It will be able to learn a decision boundary better if we are talking of text classification. Okay, so like I mentioned that uh, these words, it should be a space that these words are neighbors of each other and accommodation and let's say car, I mean so this is something that the meaning of the sentence of the word of two words, if it's similar then it should be, uh, they should be closer and even if they have a different syntax like uh, hotel and uh, accommodation, lodging, these have diff these are completely different words, your simple vectorizers won't be able to catch it, but if you are able to find some embeddings, it will be able to uh, catch. So uh, there are several existing models for constructing word embeddings, uh, word to vec is a common one because that became popular uh, initially, Th that was the first one to become popular and that it is, it is uh, most widely used. So basically, uh, we'll be discussing how even it is constructed uh, later. But to give you an idea, uh, it's word to vec or any other kind of uh, word embedding models. What they typically do, they define a feature space and based on some kind of mathematics, all the words are mapped to that space so that contextually similar words are somewhere near each other, right? And also, it gives you a flexibility that okay, they, I mean the, the people who have actually made these, have shared these public provide you pre-trained embeddings. So pre-trained is they are trained on some news articles or uh, you know some billions of words. What you can do, you can either use them as it is or you can retrain them on your own training data that you have and then you can work on it. So basically, uh, have you heard of the term transfer learning? Okay, so that's a well-known term in deep learning. What it does is instead of training something from scratch, you have a pre-trained, uh, I mean on some other data you have a network, a deep network and you just retrain it or fine-tune it, just don't, don't need, no need to build it from scratch but fine-tune it to your training data and that is workable for you. So that is transfer learning initially built on some other corpus or data and then you fine tune it for your data and it works fine, right? So uh, an idea of word embeddings, these are some of the interesting uh, things that come out of word embeddings, what uh, mathematics they, they learn that you can see that the distance, the vector distance between man and woman is similar to uncle and aunt. It is, a, I mean, they are different vectors, but their direction is same. So if you take the, so basically how do you find similarity or dissimilarity in vector spaces? Cosine is basically uh, a very common one. 
cosine of two vectors, it gives you how similar they are, right? So, 1 would mean that similar and 0 would mean not similar, anything in between tells you how it is. So, likewise king and queen, so th that's how, are you able to understand how it is going? So, even, even when you see, uh, you, can, you can even try it uh, while coding that if you take the vectors of king minus man plus woman, you actually get a very uh, similar vector to what a, a, the word queen has. So, that means it has been able to find that whatever is like man minus woman, right? So, that is capturing the context of gender you apply, you are applying that mapping to king. So, it is, it is able to map back that okay, that gender information when added or subtracted from king is queen. So, it means that whatever information you subtract, when you do man minus woman, you get that piece of information. When you subtract that from king, you get queen. So, those are the kind of relationships which actually prove that it is able to capture the context. Yeah, right. Yeah, so uh, like in word to vec, let us say it is a 300 dimension embedding. So, these are, these all will be 300 dimension embeddings. These will be vectors. So, vector addition subtraction we are basically doing. So, in nutshell we can say that what is a word embedding? A word embedding is that basically a word is known by the company it keeps. Uh, kind of the friends of that word which are contextually meaningful uh, similar to that word. So, this is also one example of it. Similar meaning words appear similar in the space and uh, nearby in the space. Okay. So, uh, when we compare it, yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it depends on your vocabulary. So, it is occurring multiple times. So, it will take the context from your text to place it, yeah, to place it wherever it is. So, basically using Yeah, kind of the context. We will discuss how it does. There are typically three ways and more importantly two ways how it does is uh, depending upon if a word, then what are the contextually surrounding words either you take this word and predict what would be the surrounding words or you take the surrounding words and predict what would be the middle word, something like that. So, basically comparing your traditional uh, models against the word embeddings. So, okay, one more term, uh, one hot encoding basically, that is also quite famous, uh, what it is. So, one hot encoding is like in a sentence, what we simply did, we uh, took out ones which are in that sentence. One hot encoding is something similar, but at uh, even a lower level of word level. You have 11 words to represent one word, it would be 11th length vector and like we had I like English movie. So, the one hot encoding of the word like, the token like would be 0, 1 and all zeros. So, that uh, count vectorizer example, we took when we had to create a vector of sentence, right, 1, 1, 1, 1 and all 7 zeros. But when we want to define a vector of a word, then that is corresponding to that one hot encoding where corresponding to that word's index, the value is 1 and all are 0. So, it is typically a sparse vector, right. Each word in vocabulary is represented by one bit position in a huge vector. So, what would be the size of that vector? Equivalent to the size of your vocabulary. So, this is an example that only one, one would be there, rest all would be zeros. The context is not utilized. You are not using what came before hello, what came after hello. It simply, an in, it, it randomly got an index based on its occurrence and based on that you are providing one to that index and zero to others. Whereas, what happens in case of word embeddings, it stores each word as a point in space where it is represented a vector of fixed number of dimensions. So, an example of word to vec is it, it uses a 300 dimension. There are different variations available depending upon what you want to use. You can try and experiment that. So, what happens? Each point is projected to a 300 dimension space. 
uh, it is unsupervised that means you can train it on a large corpus and you don't need to actually annotate anything it can learn from the context that which word should be nearby basically depending upon your incoming sentences it is trying to learn which words have the similar meaning which words appear contextually closer to each other right We will come to it, we will be actually discussing how word embeddings, yeah. So basically it is that you provide the words and for each word you get exactly like it is a network, kind of a neural network and you have 300 nodes, so you will get weights on those nodes. You get the values corresponding to each word. Does that answer? Okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, in this particular case it would not be a sparse vector, it would actually be a 300 dimension vector which would be having values of at each dimension now again the value at each dimension determines where the, 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 the gradient of that in which direction that vector is going so uh, dimensions are basically projections along uh, different axes and that is like the vector mathematics that we have whereas here we simply have for each word just one and rest all are zeros. Uh, so okay so they so basically these are the advantages of word embeddings and uh, since they are unsupervised you can have any size of your uh, training data and you do not need to annotate any la labels of this is this word means that and you have uh, pre-trained embeddings you can train it on your own corpus whatever data that you have so that is an advantage you do not have to do any labeling so that helps you scale up you can add up any size of training data you want. So this is the formal definition of what it is, collective name for a set of language modeling and feature learning techniques in NLP where words or phrases from vocabulary are mapped to vectors of real numbers, not ones and zeros, actually real numbers. So uh, when, when, when we say feature learning techniques, it is actually a feature learning techniques because the 300 dimension uh, feature that you get you can actually use it to categorize your words, your sentences, your documents and then feed it to your machine learning classifier or deep learning whatever you want to learn out of it. So again some of the examples of uh, how it, it shows uh, mappings between. So this is also interesting past tense and present and how mapping it can uh, learn the mapping this is again what we had shown before so how do we actually uh, build these uh, vectors so there is some mathematical learning behind it how do we find what are a vector words neighbors so basically by neighbors which mean the words which appear closer right uh, we will discuss how to build such lower, so when we call lower dimensional definitely because the dimension is much lower than the vocabulary that we have. So we, are pro we have to project data from the higher dimension to a lower dimension. So some of the uh, famous uh, word embeddings are word to vec which became very popular initially and then uh, some more have come up. These are globe, global vector representations in brackets have shown who have proposed this uh, and fast text. This is by Facebook, right. So uh, what we will start with word to vec, we will move to globe and fast text. Any questions so far? All of you are, are, are all of you familiar with this? Right. So th that was to start with that what are the various problems in LLP and definitely some are towards being solved and some are still uh, very far from getting solved so 
I mean, there are different things. Yeah, definitely this solves. Again, we'll be discussing how uh, there is also an interesting problem of out of vocabulary words. Uh, when you train word to x, so you're training it on a vocabulary. So how do you deal with words which are which the word to x model has not seen? Where to project them? So this is something which uh, solves that problem as well. So yes, definitely, uh, you're right. Uh, they, initially, there are some problems, and as and when new algorithms come, they keep on solving various problems. Yeah. Any other question? So, uh, do we uh, do we pause for one and a half? Okay, so let's start it after a break. It's a fresh topic, so it will be better to start it after the break.